16 through 20. Citizens, when they blaspheme the name, shall be put to death. Anyone who kills a human being should be put to death. Anyone who kills an animal should make restitution for it, life for life. Anyone who maims another shall suffer the same injury in return. Fracture for fracture, eye for eye, tooth for tooth. The injury inflicted is the injury to be suffered. And the second reading is Matthew chapter 5, 38 to 48. You have heard that it was said, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. But I say to you, do not resist an evildoer. But if anyone strikes you on the right cheek, turn the other also. And if anyone wants to sue you and take your coat, give your cloak as well. And if anyone forces you to go one mile, go also the second mile. Give to everyone who begs from you, and do not refuse anyone who wants to borrow from you. You have heard that it was said, you shall love your neighbour and hate your enemy. But I say to you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you, so that you may be children of your Father in heaven. For me, he makes his son rise on the evil and on the good, and he sends rain on the righteous and on the unrighteous. For if you love those who love you, what reward do you have? Do not even the tax collectors do the same? And if you greet only your brothers and sisters, what more are you doing than others? Do not even the Gentiles do the same? Be perfect, therefore, as your heavenly Father is perfect. Hi again. I have to tell you, I'm nervous. It's a very, very complicated topic that we're addressing today. It's really, really difficult to get our heads around, to understand all of the ramifications and all of the ways that people are impacted and all of the things that there are to think about. And I, I thought I would start out um, by talking a little bit, let me make sure I go this way first, about my own experiences with guns, right? My, well, first of all, my name's Ken. Some of you don't even know who I am. I'm Ken. I'm the office manager here at the church, and you might say, well, why is the office manager preaching? Well, I was a pastor in a former life in a conservative evangelical church in Hillsboro for 13 years, going from worship pastor to administrative pastor to lead pastor over that time. And knowing that I come from a conservative and evangelical background, you may think that I have a conservative view about gun control and about gun violence. And I can tell you, my views have changed over the years. And I, I wonder if you're willing to have your views changed. Are you open to learning and growing and seeing things differently? Because I did that and I, and I, I don't have it all figured out. And I don't have my mind made up, but I do believe that it's worth talking about and it's worth investigating it's for all of us to put our heads together with this problem. Am I right? Yeah. All right. Well, so my experiences with guns start really, really young. My parents, my family was not a gun family, but we had that proverbial shotgun over the mantle, over there, called a rusty thing that we didn't even know if it would shoot or not. But to be honest, we didn't know if it was safe and it just sat up there. And, I think eventually it just got rid of over time. That was my first experience with guns. And then ever since I was a little kid, I don't know about you, but I've just been fascinated with them. I mean, ever since I was little, all, me and all my friends, we used to just run around and whatever stick looked most like a gun was the stick I wanted, right? Because I'd point that stick and we would play war or we would play cops and robbers and we would shoot each other and chase each other around and that was, Fun. And I don't know what brought that out of me. I don't know if it was television, or if it was the Lone Ranger, or if it was Star Wars. How many of you remember Star Wars? Of course, right? 1977. I'm a child of the 70s and 80s, so that movie was really influential. And I remember 
that famous scene with Han Solo, right? Where Luke Skywalker's in the Millennium Falcon, and he's got that mask on his face. Do you guys remember this? Right? And he's trying to learn the Force, and he's trying to become a Jedi, and Han Solo is kind of the cynical pirate guy, right? And he says, Hopi religions and ancient weapons are no match for a good blaster at your side. And I don't know if you remember Han Solo's gun, but it was a cool gun. I mean, I, it just was this old, and they based it on old German guns and that sort of thing. So, but I don't know if it was Star Wars and laser guns or what it was, but there's just a fascination with it. And my, my family life, too, at home wasn't the greatest when I was growing up. And so I thought about running away a lot. And so one of the things I wanted to make sure I had if I ever ran away was a gun of some sort. Because how am I supposed to hunt in the woods out of a little fort that I'm going to build after I run away? Right? If, I don't, if I don't have a gun. So I wanted to have a BB gun, fascinated in BB guns. My parents got me a BB gun and, and I enjoyed that and thought that would be if I could get away someday. That's how I would survive. These are the things kids think, right? And, you know, getting older, I, I never really owned guns as a kid or owned guns as an adult. Um, I remember when I was about 19, I had a friend who was 21 and he got a handgun for me the first time. And I remember one time being out cruising. Do you remember cruising? Yeah. We went out to this town way away from where we live to go cruise because that's for girls that didn't know you were. <laughs> right? So, so we're there, and there's some kind of there's some kind of scuffle happening, and there's guys that don't like us there. Or don't I don't know if, if we cut them off or if something happened, but suddenly they're around the car and they're trying to get in, and they're in front of the car and we can't do it. And my friend has this gun, and he pulls it out and waves it, and everybody goes. Shh. Right? And we're able to get away. And of course the police find us very soon after that. But he's registered, he's licensed, he's legal. And he got the gun taken away from him, but eventually he was able to get it back. So I have, I have that experience with guns too, where they helped me in a certain way. Um, and then as I, was, as I was a pastor in my adult life, we would have men's retreats, right? These are those testosterone-filled weekends or even week-long trips out to somewhere way out in the middle of nowhere where we could all shoot guns. <laughs> that really was the whole point. It, it, I'll tell you about it. We would have a convoy of trucks, right? Guys in four-wheel drive trucks. And we would be, we'd be all driving through eastern Oregon, through the desert, trying to find out somewhere in, in in whatever that is, BLM land, Bureau of Land Management, that free land that you can go out and we just build big fires and go into the lava tubes and set up targets and clay kitchens and all that and just shoot, shoot, shoot to our heart's content. And one of the trucks didn't have people in it, it was just guns. Full, a whole truck bed full of cases. Of ca so I've shot lots of them and lots of kinds of guns. And I've shot AR-15s and AK-47s and nine millimeters and big 50 caliber Desert Eagles that you know, make your hand go like this when you shoot them. And I'll tell you, it's fun. It's very fun. I will also tell you that my first time, it was very scary. And almost every time, in fact, it was very scary because you have this sense of wielding death in your hand and the responsibility of that and the carefulness of that and the power of that can be frightening and, and it was frightening for me and, and so then I had all of these friends who had guns right and all these friends who loved their guns and knew all of the arguments about why guns were good, why we need more guns. And they would be the kind of people who would say, we need to arm the teachers to protect the students, and we need to arm convenience store people, and we need to arm everybody, because more guns in society will make society safer. That's the argument that you hear a lot, right? If you have a gun to protect yourself, that will stop somebody, like me, in the car, 
when I was a kid, right? I, my friend waved that gun. Suddenly we were safe. And that's a, that's a very powerful feeling too. And self-defense is one of those things that's very, very important to gun owners. It's one of the primary things that they point to to say this is why I want to have a gun. They're not all hunters. They're not all sportsmen. They're not all target shooters. But almost all of them will say self-defense. That's why I have a gun. Self-defense. So those are a little bit of my experiences with guns growing up and some of the relationships and people and events that kind of have shaped my views of guns over the years. But let me give you some statistics and some facts and, you know, statistics, facts, that's kind of a misleading thing, right? But for what it's worth, um, let, me, let me go through some of the statistics that I have here. Um, you may know this already, but America has the most mass shootings of any developed country by a factor of 20. So England, Australia, UK, Finland, Denmark, France, Germany, Australia, factor of 20 more mass shootings than these countries. And it used to be that mass shootings in America average about every six months or so, really, really slow since they started tracking them back in the 40s or whatever the first one. Death defined by four or more people killed in a public place. And you average that out to about 2011, and it averaged about every six months. But since 2011, mass shootings have been averaging every two months. So the rate of these mass shootings has been increasing. And nearly 100 people are killed by guns in America every day. Almost 100 people killed by guns in America every day. Now, 60% of those are suicide. So almost 60 people a day commit suicide by gun. About 30% of those 100 are homicides, and 10% are accidents, mass shootings, police actions, and that sort of thing. And the United States has the highest suicide rate among developed countries. And I want to point out, there's a suicide rate and there's an attempted suicide rate. Can you tell what the difference is? The suicide rate is the successful ones. It's not a rate about how many people want to commit suicide or how many people try to commit suicide. It's how many people successfully commit suicide. And among developed countries, our people are the most successful at killing themselves. Now, why is that? Well, almost 50% of suicides are gun-related suicides. Of all of the suicides that are attempted in America every year, half of them are attempted with guns. And, well, I should, I'm, I'm confusing that. Not, so 50% of all suicides are gun suicides, and, and that's because guns are very effective. Guns are really good at killing people. That's what they were designed for. And the vast majority of suicide attempts that fail are not repeated successfully. So there's this idea that, well, you know, if you get rid of guns, the people will just figure out a way to kill themselves some other way. Well, they'll try, but they're going to try something that doesn't work as good. Poison doesn't work as good. Jumping off a bridge doesn't work. Guns are the most effective way to kill yourself. Also, the homicide rate in America. So that's the suicide rate. We have the highest suicide rate of developed countries because we use guns to kill ourselves. And we have the highest homicide rate of all developed countries. It's over three times higher than the rest of the developed countries. And over 80% of those homicides are committed by using guns. Now people might say, well, you know, it just means that we're a more violent society, that we have more crime in our society. But that doesn't, uh, that's not the case. America actually has lower rates of other crimes like burglary and assault than almost all other developed countries. So our crime rate 
rates are not higher, crime is not more frequent in America than in these other countries. It's just more lethal. This gun violence problem is unique to America. It's unique among these developed countries of the world. And why is that? Because at the same time, we have more guns per capita in this country than any other country, than any of these other developed countries, by a very large margin, double or more in most cases comparing country to country. In fact, there are more, the more guns that are in a country, the more gun deaths you see in that country. So gun deaths and gun quantity are positively correlated across all of these developed countries. Not only that, it's the same for U.S. states. States that have more guns in America have higher gun deaths than states that don't. Yet people still claim that more guns will make us safer. I guess we don't have enough guns yet. That's what gun dealers and gun manufacturers want us to believe, right? Because they're selling us those guns. They want to sell more. They also claim that reducing guns won't reduce homicides. They say that guns don't kill people. People kill people. I say people with guns kill people much more effectively. And every hunter knows this, right? Bow hunting, hunting with a bow and arrow is hard. Any hunters in here? It's hard to hunt with a bow and arrow. Good luck with a knife. Look <laughs> at right? that deer with a knife. The deer would be happy for gun control, right? The same number of deers will not get killed with knives as they do with guns. And the same is true for people. So I don't think that the murder rate would stay the same as if guns became more restrictive. Because without guns, murder becomes much harder. But should we restrict guns? What about self-defense? What about the crowd of guys around the car? In a country with 300 million guns, that's a legitimate concern. But for me, the cross teaches me something about this. It teaches me that Jesus laid down his life willingly. He didn't fight to defend his own life. And he told his disciples not to defend him. The cross is a hard thing to understand. The way of Christ is a hard thing to follow. And we read that Jesus taught his disciples to love their enemies. Now, how do you do that? What does that even mean? How, how do you love your enemies? The early church, those years are full of stories of martyrs who willingly die rather than fight. Jesus teaches us that our response to violence must not be more violence. Christian pacifists today will say that It'd be better to die the right way than to live the wrong way. And so to die, if need be, for the sake of love, for the sake of peace, for the sake of the cross, and nonviolence would be a higher priority to a Christian pacifist than protecting their own life. And Jesus calls us to love our enemies, and in no small Measure does this require us to trust God? The hymn that we just sang, The Mighty Fortress is Our God, is all about that. It's all about placing our trust in God and not in ourselves or our sight. But it's not easy. I think about what it means to love. And I think about my children and how I love my children. And that's a pretty strong love. That's a pretty real love. That's a love that brings out action in me, right? That makes me act on their behalf and for them and in ways that helps them and nurtures them and grows them and develops them and just 
loves them and cares for them. That's this, this innate love that might be one of the truest loves we can experience as humans. Is that love that you have for your children. And is it possible to have that kind of love for an enemy? Could you have that kind of love for someone who is abusing you, as Jesus mentioned, who's persecuting you, who is your enemy? Do you love them like they're your own child? I don't know. That seems really, really hard. But what would be the result if we were able to do that? I mean, do you believe in peace? Do you believe in love? Or does that sound like hokey religion to you? I'll tell you a story. There was a man who lived next door to his sister, and she called him in the middle of the night one night and said, there's an intruder in my house. And he was a gun owner, and he got his gun, and he ran right over to the house, found the intruder, confronted him, thought he saw a knife, shot him dead. Then found out it was his son. And I read that story in light of Jesus' teaching that we love our enemies, and I think to myself, if he had known that that was his son, would he have acted toward him the same way? Would his reaction have been self-defense? Would his reaction have been, I'm going to protect at whatever cost? If he knew it was his son in the dark, in that room. I don't think he would have. I think he would have done everything he could have not to shoot. Maybe he would have had to. Maybe he would have just got attacked. Maybe he wouldn't have been a Christian pacifist who would have just laid down, or who would have run, or who would have tried to find some other solution. He would have done everything. He would have talked. He would have said something. He would have begged. He would have pleaded. He would have cried. He would have whatever it took to try to solve the situation without having to kill his son. And I, I think that that's what's at the heart of this idea of loving our enemies. Is how does that mean that we treat them? How do we treat someone differently whom we love? So I'm not saying it's easy. And I'm also not saying that I have my mind made up. I, I have a gun. It's not a gun. This is complicated. <laughs> so being a part of this group of conservative guys who love to shoot, there's this whole conspiracy in those years about Obama's going to take all our guns away. And if Hillary got elected, she really would have took all our guns away. Right? There's this fear that the Democrats, whatever they may say about little steps and things, but oh, end game is no guns. End game is everybody gets their guns taken away. That's the conservative mindset. And that's why the reaction against any kind of thing that seems like common sense, like here's a list of common sense things. Common sense things. All these developing nations do these things but us. A license to have a gun. Every one of those developed countries requires you to be licensed before you can purchase a gun. Then, when you purchase a gun, it has to be registered. There's a national registry in every one of these countries that keeps track of these guns. When you buy a gun, you have to give a reason that you want to own that gun. You're required to go through significant safety training, and you're also required by law to store your gun safely. Every other developed country has these laws in place but us, and those things seem like common sense, unless you have the perspective that they're really trying to take all my guns away. That's really what they're trying to do is take all my guns away. And so in that climate, I think to myself, well, I, sh I should get a gun before they get all taken away. <laughs> and if I'm gonna get one before they all get taken away, I need to get one that's not registered so that they can't come and find it and take it away. So I bought what's called an 80% lower. 
Anybody know what an 80% lower is? Okay. So everybody hates gun loopholes, right? Here's a big one. An 80% lower is the part of an AR-15 that is considered by the federal government to be the firearm. The barrel is not the firearm. The stock is not the firearm. The trigger, the, the sight, the, all the stuff that's involved in the gun is not the gun except what's called the lower receiver. That's the part where the, where the, where the firing mechanism and the bullets go. And that part can be made in such a way that it's only 80% complete. And if it's only 80% complete, then it's legally not a firearm. So there is no regulation at all on it. It's just a piece of steel or plastic, and it happens to look exactly like an AR-15 lower receiver, except it just doesn't have a few things routed out. Got about 20% of routing left to do, right? And I've got one of those at home, along with all of the other parts that could make an AR-15. And they're all in a box in my closet. And my thinking at the time was, if I ever need one, right, when the zombie apocalypse comes, this is the, <laughs> the zombie apocalypse is going to come, and the government's going to take over, and it's going to be martial law, and we better all have our guns to protect ourselves from the masses of unlawful and unlaw-abiding citizens that won't have the protection of law and order in a time like that. So I'll get it, and then I'll get my little Dremel tool, and I'll grab this is silly thinking. Right? And in some emergency, I'll route, have time to route this thing out and make a gun out of it to defend my family or to go hunt food, you know, in some kind of disaster or something. <laughs> we all have to survive. So, uh, as, saying all that to say there's, there's all kinds of, the government doesn't know I have this gun, it's not really a gun, and that's why, but I can make it a gun overnight and have one that they would never know about. And my commitment to you today is that I'm going to get rid of it of that 80 lower and all those parts. I'm gonna to go to the police department and say, here you go, I'm turning this in. Now that is, I think, a, a very good way to enact certain types of gun control legislations. Like there was an assault weapons bill that was going to go up for vote, and there were things about it that it didn't work out. And I'll have to tell you, I know that an AR-15 is not any different than any other hunting rifle where you can pull the trigger once and it shoots once. That's all an AR-15 does too. Pull once, shoot once, pull once, shoot once. Every other hunting rifle that's semi-automatic, that's not bolt action, any other one is the same way. An AR-15 just looks different. It's got suppressors and it looks like a military thing. So I understand the arguments about, well, you can't just ban a gun based on how it looks. You should ban it based on its functionality. I totally get that. At the same time, People should be able to willingly give those up if they want to, right? We should, and we can say, well, we don't want to sell them anymore. Let's stop selling them. The people that have them can have them, but you can give them up freely. Australia did this in 1996. The UK did this in 1996. They passed major gun reform in their countries, and then citizens voluntarily brought the guns that they owned up. Because this is another argument, right? Is that we'll never get rid of all the guns in America. And we can never get rid of them. Well, you can get rid of anything with enough time. Right? We don't have any more. It, there's, uh, we'll, we'll try to find an ancient Colt pistol from the 8th. They're super, super rare. Right? And things just deteriorate and over time they disappear. And the more people that give them up or lose them or bury them or whatever, over time we can see dramatic reductions in the number of guns without in, necessarily infringing on the rights of responsible people to have their own guns. And so that's kind of what our forum is going to be about today. We've got a few speakers that are going to come and they're going to talk to us about legislation, they're going to talk to us about the gun violence problem, they're probably going to give some more statistics. They've also got their own personal stories to share. Gun safety is another huge issue, right? One thing is how do you keep guns out of the hands of people that don't have them? At the same time, people that do have them, how do they have them more safely? Another very, very important topic to talk about. And not enough time to hit it all today. That's another thing. I'm kind of out of time. There's so many more things to talk about and so much more that can be said on this topic and so much more for me to learn. And if nothing else, I hope that this encourages all of you 
to learn some more and learn how to talk to people who don't have the same view that you might have. And let's see if we can find common ground together to enact some kind of progress on this issue. Can we do that? All right. Can we pray? God, I thank you for your provision and your protection and for your peace, for your love. God, I thank you for all the ways that you have um, helped me to bring this message today, God, and in all the ways that I have that I have failed and that I have not met the standards that that, uh, that I would have liked to, Lord. And, and there are people here who are hearing things and are, are not agreeing, and they are agreeing, and some are not, and some are. And then, Lord, I pray for your peace on this issue, God, that this would not be an issue of division for this church, but it would be uh, an issue of growth and progress, not only for this church, but for our country and for our world.